facilities in South Asia and the Middle East are most at risk. But the Bush administration didn't want to take any chances here in the States. The most likely targets of Al-Qaeda attacks are the transportation and energy sectors and facilities or gatherings that would be recognized worldwide as symbols of American power or security. Meantime, because of the security alerts, Vice President Dick Cheney has already been brought to an undisclosed location. Well, here in Louisiana, Entergy says tonight National Guard troops will be used to protect the state's nuclear power plants. It's just one of many measures being taken around the city and state to keep us safe. Josh McKelvin joins us now with more on that and how people are coping with the alert. Josh? Well, Dennis, we head into the one-year anniversary of September 11th. Today's alert is serving as a reminder that although a year has passed, the danger has not. And while law enforcement officials are tightening security, a very quiet Armstrong International tonight illustrates how most folks will mark the day on the ground and close to home. It's like a ghost town here. And uh, we had to go ask some of the some of the people at the desk, you know, where is everybody? What's happening? On the eve of September 11th, employees at Armstrong International tonight seem to outnumber passengers. And while most travelers said today's terror alert didn't bother them, the desolation at Armstrong did. It's kind of scary. Makes you think that uh, this is now country. Although the concourse was near deserted, Armstrong officials say today's travel was off only about 30 percent of normal. And while the government raised the threat of terrorism to a high level, the airport is status quo. The, uh, the change was to a national security uh, alert level. Uh, it actually does not have an impact directly on us. We were already operating at a particularly high level of, of airport security. And the rest of the state is following suit. The Office of Emergency Preparedness in Baton Rouge is up and running just in case. And security has been tightened at areas that law enforcement considers a potential target. Places like the Capitol or the state's many refineries. Place all of our uh, employ our offices on telephone standby. Uh, we've heightened those security in, uh, in those areas that uh, we had done uh, threat assessments on in the past. Uh, so now we're, we're implementing uh, the plan. State Police Colonel Terry Landry says certain aspects of the security efforts are secret. But the visible presence will be there as well with more than a thousand troopers on patrol. But even with the latest alert, most New Orleanians say they still feel safe. Uh, at this time, I'm pretty comfortable with circumstances. I think the United States government have everything under control. I'm not overly concerned because I know what we can do as a people. And I've seen what we could do as a people. And so I'm going to go on and, and just do what I've always been doing because this is America. And it's important to keep in mind that law enforcement agencies say there is no intelligence to suggest that any facilities in Louisiana have been targeted by terrorists. But like the rest of the country, no one is taking any chances. Mm -hmm. Dennis, Karen. All right, Josh, thank you. Tomorrow, New York will stand still along the, with the rest of the country to remember those who lost their lives in the terror attacks. Today, some people from Louisiana were drawn to Ground Zero to try to do their part to remember, reflect, and heal. Jennifer John is live in New York with more. Jennifer? Karen, Manhattan is teeming with people from all over the world. Today, two Louisiana natives crossed paths at Ground Zero and didn't even realize it. One is a social worker from Lafayette. He volunteered at Ground Zero after September 11th, and now he's back looking for closure. The other man is looking for a way to keep all of the victims fresh in our minds. Johnny Patu's memory of 9-11 is horrific. It's made up of the individual tragedies from the countless people he counseled. Uh, I learned that Red Cross was looking for some uh, volunteers, uh, especially in mental health. Patu spent several weeks in New York over the past year providing grief counseling. This time he came to deal with his own grief. For me, that maybe puts some closure to uh, a year of tragedy, you know. He's not alone and quickly runs into other former Red Cross volunteers who are trying to do the same thing, though they can't seem to put the memories to rest. Boats were coming over with wounded and they thought it was the end of the world. When we first came down here, the rescue and the relief workers, the Red Cross people, the relief workers, they were writing their social security numbers on their arms yeah. because the glass was falling out of the windows. Yeah. Uh, and that smell. Oh, the yeah. smell. Smell just stayed with me for weeks and weeks, you know. 
It's a strange chat among strangers, something Patu calls traumatic bonding. A short walk down the viewing platform, he finds healing of a different kind. Being arrested, Lisa Frost was a passenger on the ill-fated United Airlines Flight 175. Three actors reading short biographies of each World Trade Center victim. Father of Nicole, two, with another child on the way, Mr. Gardenberg, 35, was moving out of his office at World, at one World Trade Center on September 11th. Mr. James M. Gartenberg. This summer was going to be the last, said Tracy Gazzini, his mother. He started there in college, but bouncing and working at Cantor Fitzgerald was a little bit too much. Carl Palmer grew up just outside New Orleans in Norco, graduated from LSU, and eight years ago moved to New York City. This is his way to honor the more than 2,800 victims. He read aloud for 13 hours yesterday, expecting to go longer today. I just think it's, it's, it's simple, it's, it's, it's truthful, it's, it's really kind of beautiful. For his wife Jennifer, he marked every important date with cards, often five or six for each occasion. The cards came with long personal notes and always included, I love you madly. Douglas B. Gardner. The official service begins in just a few hours in New York. At 1 a.m., bagpipe processions will head out from each of the five boroughs, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, and Queens, and they'll work in a relay fashion until they reach ground zero. At 8.46 a.m. New York time, that's 7.46 Louisiana time, a minute of silence will be observed. That's the time when the first plane hit the first tower. Then that will be followed by the Gettysburg Address, read by the governor. The names of each of the World Trade Center victims will be, will be read aloud, and then parts of the Declaration of Independence. The service wraps up precisely at 10.29 a.m., and that is when the second tower fell. And we'll be bringing you reports on the Eyewitness Morning News tomorrow about the services. For now, reporting live across the Hudson, I'm Jennifer John, Eyewitness News Nightwatch. Jennifer, how would you describe the mood tonight? Is there a sense of tension or not? There's definitely tension because of those uh, terror alerts. In fact, here in Jersey City, we're just across the Hudson from Lower Manhattan, and, and just in this city alone, there were uh, three bomb threats today, the police tell us. None of them turned into anything, but it's just, it increases the tension for people worrying about whether or not anything is going to happen, in addition to the fact that everyone's facing the one-year anniversary. Thanks, Jennifer. The Ascension Parish Sheriff's firing range here in Gonzales already serves more than 70 different agencies, including postal inspectors, the FBI, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, and the NOPD. But now a new plan calls for expanding this into an anti-terrorism training center for local law officers. The overall plan here is a, a complete mock city. Uh, we have everything from a uh, church and a cemetery. We've got two different types of houses. One's Dr. Ron Wells foundation. has designed an we'll urban combat well, village Louisiana on part of 68 acres that the nearby BASF chemical plant has donated. It's a village of 15 buildings where local law officers could stage drills against mock terrorists. We've got a four-story office building here. We've got a school, uh, a motel, conf a convenience store. This live fire shoot house is the closest thing they have around here right now to the urban combat village they're planning. Officers use this to train on making entry into houses and buildings where gunmen could be laying in wait, where gunmen could be holding hostages. And to make the experience even more realistic, they could use role playing to have training instructors fire back with simulated ammunition. But this new age of fighting terror demands much more aggressive, much more complicated drills and more sophisticated training. We worry about uh, large-scale crime scene preservation, where when we come in, not only are we in a life-saving mode and the rescue mode, but we're also in the reality that these are crime scenes. So training in that regard, the planned training facility here in Gonzales will have a command center, hardwired to monitor and control every part of this urban combat village, where officers are running through mock terror scenarios. An instructor can take a team in, brief the team, go through a scenario. Everything can be remotely controlled here, including lighting, smoke, water, fog, uh, recorded uh, on video, 
and then after the team finishes, come back in there for debriefing. The plan calls for the local officers who train here to do some of their classroom work and to live in dorms at the former Hansen Disease Center, 15 minutes away in Carville. This would be a typical dorm room, not too bad. And we'll get it painted up, fixed up, where you can do your study, and then you got a bed and all that type of stuff. So this one Colonel Herbert now, Fritz uh, runs what is now the Gillis Long National Guard installation here in Carville. It's just like it's like a little city, a little community that's all self-contained. He says the dining rooms and kitchens here can more than provide for the 80 officers at a time that would be run through the anti-terror program. The, the renovation project right here is sitting right around $2 million to renovate and get this building up and running. The center to be called the Southern Anti-Terrorist Regional Training Academy, or SARTA, would train officers in both anti-terrorism and counter-terrorism. Counter-terrorism is responding to a terrorist event that has happened. That may be a, a, you know, a shooting, a terrorist incident where shootings involved. Anti-terrorism is the job of trying to prevent terrorism from taking place, such as training local officers on what to look for on visas and immigration documents. How to spot forgeries, how to spot false documents. Of course, federal agents are already getting this kind of training. In fact, the federal government is even helping foreign nationals get this kind of training at LSU's Anti Terrorism Assistance Program. Colonel Robert is a part time instructor there. And they'll bring in these foreign teams and they'll stay from between two and six weeks and get this first class, world class training. Meantime, I... Robert says there is no anti terror training center for local law officers. But as we saw in last year's attacks, it's the local police, fire, and EMS who are the first to respond when terror strikes and the last to pick up the pieces. If we have a terrorism incident here in Ascension Parish or in the southern uh, Louisiana area, it's eight to ten hour response time for the specialized SWAT unit, if you will, with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The plans for the Anti-Terror Academy in these woods call for training up to 4,000 local law officers a year. There will be some classes mixing in. You talk about responding to a major crime scene, a major event. We will have classes that will bring in uh, EMS fire just to coordinate the response to a large event. The total price tag for getting the whole operation together here at Gonzales and at Carville, about ten and a half million dollars. Committees in the U.S. House and Senate have already recommended approving the first two million dollars. My Lord, it's one year anniversary. It's the worst uh, attack on, on American soil, so we would hope that we could be breaking ground here, you know, within the next quarter. The anti-terrorism training center for local police was in the works before last year's terror attacks, but officials say those attacks gave the plans a new focus. Sounds like a smart idea. Yeah.